Welcome! This is Radioactive Banana, and it's October 16th at 3.38 p.m. And this is part three of my Afghanistan mining investigation, where I'm going to go over the owners and the minerals of Afghanistan and all their natural resources. And in part one, I went over the fact that the Rockefellers could control the army, the National Guard, militias, and the Pinkertons to control the striking miners of Montana and Colorado. And there was actually a massacre in Colorado when the miners wouldn't go back to work. And I pondered, do the Rockefellers control the U.S. military? And I also showed a Rockefeller Morgan family trust um, flowchart. And when you see that, you see how the Rockefellers could control other industries to do what they want. So they could essentially tell the government or the military, if you don't do what we want, we will shut down all these industries. We will destroy, you know, people's incomes, their livelihoods. And, uh, you know, I pondered, can they still do this today? Which I think they can. And in part two, I went over articles by Michelle Shosodovsky, West Point, USGS, and the Department of Energy. And USGS says that they've mapped Afghanistan with this new high-tech equipment and that they found all these unknown deposits. Well, when we read through Shosodovsky, West Point, and the Department of Energy, we see that they were less than forthcoming and that they have known about the minerals in Afghanistan for a very long time. And in fact, the Department of Energy says it's been over a hundred years of intensive investigations. West Point lets us know that um, Russia and Sweden and France and the British and UK have also mapped Afghanistan. So USGS saying that these were unknown deposits is really not true. This information has been around for a long time. So in my last video, I started a new phrasebook, the Radioactive Banana Phrasebook, or just RB Phrasebook. And the first phrase is, lying ass bastards, which will be substituted for the phrase, less than forthcoming. And I have a new phrase, arrogant pricks, which will be substituted for, their work is very interesting. You can use that also at art galleries or any sort of art function where you absolutely cannot stand what you've just seen. And maybe the artist comes up and says, well, what did you think of my work? And you just say, that was very interesting. It really is a great insult in the arts to just tell someone that their work was very interesting. So you can use this phrase a lot. But let's get in to all the natural resources of Afghanistan and some of the owners. I think it's important to discuss mining in Afghanistan and their natural resources because they are so very wealthy. The Taliban and the Afghanistan government has vast wealth right now. But what do we see on YouTube when I search for humanitarian crisis? What is going on is they're saying, you know, there's huge humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and, uh, you know, Afghanistan faces humanitarian crisis as Taliban takes control. Afghanistan is humanitarian crisis in the making. And they have had so much wealth for years and years. And we really need to help get this information out to the people so they can take back their country. They're going to bring in all these Rockefeller nonprofits, you know, and begin to build their Rockefeller hospitals and Big Pharma. And they're just slowly going to bring in corporations and take over Afghanistan. When Afghanistan has the ability to help its people. So what are they doing with all that money? Uh, so I ask that you help me to get this out to soldiers from the U.S. military who went to Afghanistan, you know, via Twitter or other social media. I was kicked off Twitter a while ago. Yeah, yeah, I was. <laughs> I didn't have my phrase book then, and so I just was a little harsh and got kicked off Twitter. 
But anyway, if you could help me get this information out, because the people of Afghanistan need to know that they have vast wealth right now, have had it for years, and they need to take back their country from the Rockefellers. I decided I needed to go out and look at some official documents to try and find out about the natural resources of Afghanistan. And so I went to the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum website. And I've shown this in the last video uh, where I predict a false flag of the government saying, you know, we're going to have to shut off the electricity and they're going to eventually use this to say we need to build the Tappy Pipeline. And over here where they talk about the Tappy Pipeline, they also discuss that it is not built yet, even though we know it is built. And the Ministry of Mines professes that this is a very transparent website. Though uh, out of one side of their mouth, they say that the Tappy Pipeline hasn't been built. And out of the other side of their mouth, they show the active carbon um, contracts right here. So we definitely have hydrocarbons or natural gas in Afghanistan in which they are not telling the people about. And I went over this uh, slideshow last time. It was the Asian Energy Security Summit of 2013. I went over the gas fields that were in existence as of this date, 2013. Uh, all these gas fields. And so I asked myself, well, where where is the energy from these gas pipelines going? Because they're certainly not going to the people of Afghanistan. And if you have a gas sweating plant in 2013, that means you have a power plant. And so where is the power going to? Because it's certainly not going to the people of Afghanistan. Well, where it's going to is mining. They're using the power for mining. And just like the Tappy Pipeline, they want to pretend that none of these gas fields exist, even though they have contracts for them. Now let's look at this slide. This is slide 16. And here you can see where they have mapped the oil and gas and also coal. And the next slide, what they have done is they have mapped out areas uh, or blocks where they are finding gas. And so this is the Sherbagan gas fields in the Amidari Basin. And we also have some Afghan petroleum blocks. And so you can see here they've mapped out in detail and named these various blocks. And this block right here, the Yadotak and Koja and Gorgudak block, these are the this is the area where I showed you the pipelines that have already been finished. And so you can see just how much time they have spent mapping out the hydrocarbons uh, for Afghanistan. And there's an article here that I want to share with you just so that you can understand how intensive the mapping of Afghanistan has been all while the war is going on and all these contracts are being signed. Now this article is by Sijin and it's titled Afghanistan Ministry of Mines and Petroleum finalizes Todi Maiden exploration negotiations with Turkey Petroleum, Bayat Energy, and Kalik Energy Consortium. And this is November 2015. All right, I'm just going to read just a little bit of it. Kabul and Istanbul, November 20th, 2015. The Afghanistan Ministry of Mines and Petroleum announced today the successful conclusion of hydrocarbon tender agreement negotiations with a consortium of energy companies, Turkey Petroleum, Bayat Energy, and Kalik Energy. Upon approval of the agreement by Afghanistan's cabinet, the consortium may begin natural gas exploration and production activities in the Todi Maiden block located within Afghanistan's Faryab and Zajan provinces, long regarded as one of Central Asia's most promising potential sources of natural gas. Following the negotiations in Kabul, the final stage of discussions between the consortium partners and Dr. Daud S. Saba, the Afghan Minister of Mines and Petroleum, was completed during the Atlantic Council's Energy and Economic Summit, held on November 18th through the 20th in Istanbul, Turkey. 
The exploration tender will be signed by the Consortium and the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum in Kabul. All right, and so you can see here that uh, in 2015, they were signing documents with these companies to build the gas fields in Todi Maiden. So it's 2021. Are these gas fields done or not? But I just wanted to show you that there has been extensive work on gas and that there's probably quite a few power plants inside Afghanistan and they don't have to get uh, power from Iran and from Central Asia. And it's surprising that the U.S., who can't seem to stand Iran, would even let Afghanistan pay Iran for energy. You think they would have cut that off and took over energy right away, uh, but they didn't do that. Now, we go back to here, to the active contracts, and I have looked and opened up these three files here, which are active contracts for fiscal years 1399, 98, 97, and why they use those years, I don't know. Uh, it's just confusing. But I have those pulled up here. This is a fiscal year 1399, and I'm guessing it's year 2020, and that these files are 2020, 2019, and 2018. And so what these files show across the top here is a license code, company name in English, a company TIN, mineral name, and the source of data. And so down this column you'll see all the different items, construction, uh, stone, marble, onyx, gravel, salt, and it'll show what um, province is from right here. So I went through that document, and I went through this document, which is a uh, report from the Ministry of Mine, and it has a summary, summary table of commodities, and I have put this also into an Excel chart, and I will go over it. And so this will go right up to the top here, and this is a mining sector report, the mining sector roadmap, and down below here, usually they would have the date and who did this report for the Ministry of Mine for the Ministry of Mines, but you can see that there are letters covered up and blurred out here for some reason. And um, I'm not sure why. Maybe uh, maybe the USDOD did it. <laughs> they don't want people to know. Okay. And then we have the USGS 2017-2018 Minerals Yearbook. And when I scroll down, it will bring me down to Table 1 which I have put into an Excel chart, and Table 2. Here is the USGS data from 2017 to 2018. And over here, they have to the left the list of commodities. And then going across the top, we have the year 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18. And the numbers you see here are in metric tons. So when it comes to chromium and chromite, they've had 6,369 metric tons that were mined in 2014. And all the mines are supposed to pay royalties to the government. And the government, uh, one of the sheets I have, said that they'll be making $1.2 trillion in royalties from the mine per year. So what exactly is the government doing with the money from the mines? Because they're certainly not helping the people. And if you're doing this kind of mining and this kind of tonnage, you absolutely do have to have electricity and water and railways and roadways in order to move all this stuff around. And so they have chromium, iron, cement, fluorospar, gemstones, lime. Uh, they certainly don't list all the different items, but they have some of them. And then in this table two that they have, which only goes to this color, it's not a part of the yellow color over there, um, they also list the owners. These are the owners of the mines, and over here is what they are producing. And let's see, right here I popped in fiscal year 1399. And so what I wanted to do 
was take information from all those sheets and to see exactly what were all the natural resources. And from the uh, Ministry of Mines contracts for years 1397, 98, 99, which is really um, 2018, 2019, and 2020, here is the list of items that they are mining. So you might have, if you look at construction stone over here, you might have all kinds of different companies mining construction stone, but what I just wanted to show was this was just a one thing that was being mined and not all the companies. So they have this short little list from the Afghanist or from the Ministry of Mines website. And it's just a tiny little list really of things that are being mined. And then you go over to the USGS site and they have a few more things that are being mined. One of them being aluminum. And so they never, on the 2018 year list, they never show that al aluminum is being mined and that there's contracts. They never show the contracts for emeralds. They never show the contracts for rubies or tourmaline. They cer certainly show it under the USGS um, site, but they don't show it under their oh-so-transparent website from the Ministry of Mines. Now, from the Ministry of Mines, I have written down all these different items, and there's more. But in these last two columns, this is called the list of known minerals with contracts for mining. So here's the ones that I found that had contracts. Over here, there are no contracts for all these items. And there's only just one contract for gold when there is a massive amount of gold in Afghanistan. It's, it's huge. We also don't have a contract for lithium. We don't have a contract for platinum. We don't have a contract for uh, pegamites, uh, pegmatite, <laughs> uranium, cesium, uh, all these different items we don't have contracts for. And yet I found articles about these various items now let's go from this table to looking at articles about the various owners of the minerals and about the Taliban and what they control inside Afghanistan. So this first article is by the Times headline and it was July 1st, 2017 and it's called Uranium, the Radioactive Truth about America in Afghanistan. And I'm going to scroll down and start reading here. Afghanistan has vast resources of metal, silver, gold, copper, cobalt, uranium, lithium, fuel, gas, emerald, ruby, azure, and other precious and rare minerals. Geologists estimated Afghanistan's mineral resources are as much as $3 trillion. Uranium is a very important element because it provides us with nuclear fuel used to generate electricity in nuclear power stations. It is also a major material from which other synthetic transuranium elements are made. But the main usage of that which, is Ameri which Americans seek to have this precious element is uranium, is also used by the military to power nuclear submarines and in nuclear weapons. In Afghanistan, by the pretext of fighting terrorism, USA steals uranium in Helmand. Helmand is one of the southern provinces of the country, and since the beginning of the presence of foreign troops in the country, and after the fall of the Taliban, has been the scene of battles and clashes. Plundering of mineral resources by Americans is going on for years, especially in the southern Helmand province. The availability of resources in uranium located in Kanshin and the best equipped U.S. military bases, which are located in Helmand, make USA to send large number of giant cargo planes full of uranium out of Afghanistan. After 16 years presence in Afghanistan, the process of fighting to terrorism has been changed to colonizing a country by USA and what U.S. government produced are death, poverty, dependency, and terrorism for Afghans. Now let's look at Helmand province and this is the area of interest minerals map from 2019 from the Ministry of Mines and right here is the Helmand pro uh, province and here you can see there's rare earths and uranium here and 
um, I just want to make a correction here. In the previous uh, video, um, there was a gentleman calling uh, one of the provinces Pactia, and I thought it was just, there was only Pactica, and this is also a Pactia, and sometimes being spelled with an I, um, like it was in a uh, previous article that I read. Uh, P-A-K-T-I-A. -A. So there's variations on words depending on which province you're from. <laughs> okay, so I also wanted to state that I am not here to bash the U.S. military uh, because world militaries have been doing this uh, same game also. But since I'm from the U.S., then I think we need to identify the people from the U.S. that are misbehaving, that are in the military, and those people need to be arrested. Uh, I think there are a lot of good men and women in the military, just none of them are officers. <laughs> That's my guess, my best guess. Uh, so after I found that article, I thought, well, is there another article about uranium? And I have found another article. This is by Energy Central, and it says, Curated Power Industry News from Thousands of Top Sources. And I'm going to read this. The U.S. military could be smuggling uranium out of Afghanistan, locals say. And this one is July 3rd. And the previous article I read, this one right here, was July 1st. All right. A member of Afghan par parliament from Helmand province and local residents have told Russia's Sputnik Afghanistan news agency that the U.S. military could be smuggling uranium as well as other rare elements and natural resources out of the village of Kanashin in the country's southern province of Helmand. And so before I go on, I just want to say, you know, could this possibly be propaganda? Could this be untrue that the U.S. is not really doing this? Um, because I'm only reading articles, we don't actually know. And so eventually I'll hope to find something official that says where this uranium ended up. But let's just check this out anyway. Helmand is one of the most turbulent provinces in Afghanistan and is a center of the country's mining industry and the shadowy drug smuggling industry. There are four deposits of uranium, magnetite, apatite, and carbonite in the south of this region, in the southern village of Kanashin, just 160 kilometers from the border with Pakistan. According to earlier geological exploration works, the province has lucrative uranium and thorium deposits. It also contains vast resources of tantalum and other rare elements. According to NASA estimates, there are also deposits of copper, iron, and other metals worth of $81.2 billion. Until now, there was no industrial uranium mining in Afghanistan. During Taliban rule, the captives did all the mining. And this article is the first time I've heard the captives. So did we have some slave labor going on uh, in mining? You know, in the CIA uh, death squads article, there were several people that had been disappeared and they never heard, uh, family members never heard where, you know, they went to. Uh, so were they taking people and using them for slaves in mining? We'll have to find that out. Deputies of the lower chamber of the country's parliament from the province of Helmand have repeatedly said that much evidence exists that uranium from Kanashin is being smuggled out in U.S. cargo planes. Sputnik Afghanistan quotes local media reports as saying, The deputies said that the U.S. militaries have set up their military bases near the uranium mines and smuggle uranium through it. The deputies said that since the U.S. military intervention back in 2001, the Americans and their British allies have concentrated their bases in this particular province as the largest uranium resources are concentrated there. The uranium deposits in Kanashin was previously controlled by the Taliban. However, since the foreign troops set up their air bases and airfields, which are working around the clock, in the neighboring settlement of Garmzi, the deposit has been since controlled by them. Local residents confirmed to Sputnik Afghanistan that at nights the U.S. military are smuggling out uranium in trucks and then in cargo planes. 
All right, so there's the story of uranium, and eventually I'll have to find some official document to find out the truth about uranium. But let's move on to this article. And this is from Mining Technology, and it's called The Race to Mine Afghanistan. And what I just want to note out of this article is it says the U.S. administration is reportedly keen to develop Afghanistan's extractive sector, having invested nearly $500 million already. So in 2017, the U.S. had invested in mining $500 million. Look at this beautiful picture of Afghanistan. Nice green valleys. They never really show a lot of pictures like this. Green valleys, huge, beautiful hills. But let's come down here. And it says, U.S. President Donald Trump is reported by the New York Times to have discussed the country's mineral deposits with Afghan President Ghani. Trump believes developing Afghan's extractive sector to be a win-win that could boost the country's flailing economy. All right, and it says, uh, generate jobs for Americans and give the U.S. a valuable new position in the rare earth minerals market, currently monopolized by China. All right, let's come down here. A report by the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction states that by 2009, the Department of Defense's Temporary Task Force for Business Stability Operations and the U.S. Agency for International Development had allocated near $488 million to efforts to develop the extractive industries in Afghanistan. So far, there seems to be little show for the investment. Now, of course, that is not true. And this was written in 2017. Uh, quite a bit had gone on by the time you get to 2017. So unfortunately, Mining Technology Magazine is not being as forthcoming as they could be uh, because Tappy Pipeline was underway and this Department of Defense's Temporary Task Force for Business Stability, which was started in 2009, was mentioned again in the 2012 article by USGS, which I read in part two. And by the time you get to 2012, the word temporary is gone. But I find it very interesting that the Department of Defense has a task force for business and stability operations. Um, I think they should be running the war. Hey, but what do I know? All right, let's move on. And now let's talk about gold. And up here on the screen, I have a slideshow, which is entitled Mineral Resources of Afghanistan, Drive for National and Regional Economic Development. And this slideshow was probably for investors. And it was in Mongolia on October 20th and 21st of 2011. And in this slideshow, we can see that they talk about significant deposits of gold, both placer and load. And placer gold is like panning in gravel, uh, in streams, and load gold is from tunneling into mountains. And then we have porphyry, copper and gold, and that's actually a mixture of copper, gold, and molybdenum. And so we have these large swatches of porphyry gold in Afghanistan. Okay, but let's go now to this report. And this is from the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum of Afghanistan. And this is the Mineral Resources of Afghanistan. And this was in 2020. And this document that is oh so lovely. This document goes over all these natural resources in depth has all sorts of maps and graphs and talks a lot about the Soviet maps and how uh, intensive they were and, and how great they were. And it's kind of funny that the 2012 article by USGS, um, or it was 2015 article by USGS, where they had found maps of gold and they just thrashed the uh, Russians. 
Uh, and in here, you know, they make a uh, comment on the Russians. Great maps. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. But you knew, you know, USGS, their work is so very interesting. Now, when we come down to page 40, this is when they begin to talk about gold. And I'm not going to go through this uh, very much in detail. But here you have a legend of the various kinds of gold. And here's the map showing you all the various gold that's in Afghanistan. And uh, so I just wanted to show you that. And they go really into detail, all kinds of maps. And so you can see that, you know, there's not just a war going on, but very intensive discussion of the minerals, uh, natural resources in Afghanistan. You know, mapped to the nth degree, absolutely every single part of the land is mapped. You know, and you just thought, uh, you just thought we were having a war. Nah. All right, let's look at this article. Gold worth one trillion buried in Afghanistan mountains, and this was in 2011. Trillion dollars worth of gold under the hills of war torn Afghanistan is set to be mined as the Afghan government starts its tendering process. And tendering process is when they ask for companies to bid, um, to bid on buying a mine. And the bid will have all these documents talking about the mine up to this point anyway, and different companies bid on the mine. All right, the Afghan Ministry of Mines has four separate projects up for grabs to let global companies mine both gold and copper across the troubled country. The four projects are in Badakhshan, Sarkashan, Balkhab, and Shaide. While the extract size and value of the metal reserves are unknown, the ministry is confident that there is at least a trillion dollars worth available. Good news for potential investors. All right, so uh, I just wanted to read that much that there in 2011 was four separate projects up for grabs. Now in the active uh, minerals contracts for 2018, there was one gold contract and the only gold contract it was for was for Afghan Mining Company. And don't let a name like that fool you. And you might think that that's the Afghan government, some Afghan people. It's probably the Rockefeller Group that owns the Afghan Mining Company. <laughs> so sometimes names of countries, you'll, you'll see them and you'll think, oh, they own it. It's like, no. This is just a name. This is just a cover. Uh, you have to dig deeper and find out who actually owns it. All right, so but 2011, and to date, we can only find one contract for gold. Uh, how many people think that most countries are like, nah, we don't want to go digging for gold. You've mapped it out. You know where exactly where it is, the depths, the veins. You know it all, but nah, we're not going to spend any money on mining gold. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, I believe that there are probably, a, you know, all four of these mines are probably up and running. All right, let's find out who owns the gold in Afghanistan or who's mining it. And this is by NYU Local. Wait, why is J.P. Morgan Chase mining gold in Afghanistan? And this is written September 14th, 2012 by John Sirico. In 1998, President Bill Clinton signed the Graham-Leach-Bailey Act, heralded as the masterpiece of the new economy. The law stripped away the New Deal provisions enumerated in the Glass-Steagall Act and allowed commercial banks to invade the investment sector. Alas, we had the newly created Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, and the rest of Wall Street in the American household. Years later, this would come to shotgun spray Lady Liberty back in the face. However, neither the Graham-Leach-Bailey nor the Glass-Steagall Act said anything about banks entering the energy sector, hence why we have gas prices fumbling on the back of a bunch of speculating stock traders. 
But now, a new chapter has been written in the history of financial energy prop-ups in their recent cover story on Afghanistan's trillion-dollar raw material market. The New York Times briefly mentioned that an investment consortium arranged by J.P. Morgan Chase is mining gold. Think the 1849 gold rush in Tora Bora's backyard, led by the same guys that brought you derivatives. Yeah, not good. Like the Iraqi invasion in 2003, in which the U.S. government encouraged war profiteers like Halliburton to basically rebuild Mesopotamia, the bloody Afghanistan mining fields are being chopped and screwed by the Department of Defense and sold to the highest bidder. And that's the case for the Wall Street Titan. In 2010, the DOD's Task Force for Business and Stability Operations hey, we've heard that before, bragged it had landed its first Western investment with a $50 million certificate for J.P. Morgan Chase to start drilling and production in North Afghanistan's Beglan province. Now, who does this $50 million go to? Does it go to the U.S. DOD? Does it go to the Afghan government? I don't know. With that money, Ian Hanem, a former soldier and chairman of J.P. Morgan Capital Markets at the time, led his team of Indiana Jones meets the Brook Brothers into a literal gold mine. By doing so, the Pentagon had its fingers crossed that the bank could prove that the country is safe for foreign investors. FYI, this was 2010 the climax of President Obama's surge that witnessed hundreds of deaths on both American and Afghan sides. The war effort needed a little, little bit of good PR at this point. However, much has changed in the past two years. To start, Hannum no longer works at J.P. Morgan Chase because the whole energy sector dabbling thing came back to bite him in the ass. This past year, he resigned from his top post after being charged with giving away financial secrets to Heritage Oil, a British exploratory energy company at which he was a lead advisor. Hmm. Chairman at JP and also lead advisor to Heritage Oil. All right. For his keen inability at keeping his mouth shut in disclosed emails, he was slapped on the wrist with a $721,000 fine. But, as we all know, gold is addictive as Afghan heroin, so the resignation didn't stop Hanum from his thirsty mission. Later on that month, Bloomberg Businessweek reported that Afghan Gold, the private company he started to suck up the pricey yellow blood of the Baglan province, was given VIP access to mining licenses by the Afghan government. Mine, baby, mine. Now, what Hanman looks like to me is a straw man for J.P. Morgan Chase. Now, I'm thinking something happened and J.P. Morgan Chase was unable to really get into the energy sector. And so this whole thing of Hanman resigning and getting kicked out and, you know, that helps J.P. Morgan Chase, you know, separate themselves from this bad guy and they wouldn't be working with this bad guy. Um, but then Hanman goes on to go ahead and start a gold company, Afghan Gold, and he just happens to have VIP access to mining license. Hmm. So Han Hanem looks like a straw man to me, and I'm not sure if I buy this story, but there is more I found on him that's so fun. I have already read a little bit to you from the race to mine Afghanistan from 2017, and which I noted that 500 million had been invested by the U.S. in mining in Afghanistan. But we're going to go down to here. Other foreign interests include Afghan Gold and Minerals Company, 
Now, this is the company I was referring to earlier. Uh, I called it Afghan Minerals, but it's Afghan uh, or Afghan Mining. But it's Afghan Gold and Minerals Company. And this was the only company I knew that had a um, mining license with the Afghan government. So other foreign interests include Afghan Gold and Minerals Company, founded by City of London banker Ian Hannum. Huh? What? Now this article is in 2017. The other article is in 2012. So Ian Hanman resigns from J.P. Morgan Chase, starts his own gold company, but then somehow he is a City of London banker? So was he a straw man at J.P. Morgan Chase too? Was he an infiltrator? Was I don't know if you can infiltrate the bad guys when you're a bad guy already. But this is very interesting, isn't it? He's a City of London banker. Uh, maybe he was always a City of London banker working for J.P. Morgan Chase. The firm has been named as the preferred bidder for the Balkhab Copper Deposit and Bagdekshan Gold License. The company is part owned by an Afghan consortium led by local businessman Sadat Naderi. Now, because we don't know the names of the corporations that are in this consortium, we can't tell anything about them, but this article makes us feel like it's an Afghan consortium. These are Afghan businesses, but we don't really know that unless we can see who's in the consortium. All right, so it says uh, the company is part owned by an Afghan consortium led by local businessman Sadat Naderi, with the rest held by St Centaur, a Gersney-based mining company headed by Hanum and backed by U.S. and British investors. No kidding. Would that be J.P. Morgan Chase, the Rothschilds, the Rockefeller Trust Group? I think so. The website of Centaur and its subsidiary states that have invested more than 30 million into securing mining licenses in the country's best gold and copper resource area. Furthermore, the New York Times suggests companies such as American DynCorp International, owned by a billionaire financier who is informally advising Trump on Afghanistan, according to the Times, could also benefit from extractive development by providing security. Now, I don't know if you remember Cynthia McKinney, but in one of the committee hearings, she was interviewing Donald Rumsfeld and asked him why we continued to use DynCor when they had been accused and charged of trafficking children. I thank the uh, gentleman, the uh, gentlelady from uh, Georgia, Ms. McKinney. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I watched President Bush deliver a moving speech at the United Nations in September 2003, in which he, mission, he mentioned the crisis of the sex trade. The president called for the punishment of those involved in this horrible business. But at the very moment of that speech, DynCorp was exposed for having been involved in the buying and selling of young women and children. While all of this was going on, DynCorp kept the Pentagon contract to administer the smallpox and anthrax vaccines and is now working on a plague vaccine through the Joint Vaccine Acquisition Program. Mr. Secretary, is it policy of the U.S. government to reward companies that traffic in women and little girls? Uh, so it's very interesting that one of the uh, financers, advisors, financial advisors to Trump was DynCorp. And DynCorp also works for the Department of Homeland Security. Do you think we should have a company who's been accused and found guilty of trafficking children to continue to work for the government? Yeah, I don't think we should. <laughs> I don't think we should at all. And remember, Trump was on Epstein's plane. Trump hung out with Epstein and another guy for 20 years, and they called themselves the Three Musketeers. You know, so it just says something about him that he would work with 
a company that was known to traffic. Thank you for checking out this video on part three, Afghanistan mining owners and minerals. And I'm going to continue part three in the next video with owners and minerals because there's just so much information that uh, I could probably be doing a video for three or four hours. And I know everyone's time is limited. And so I'm going to end this here. And in the next video, we'll go over uh, China's involvement, Iran, the Taliban, and uh, more minerals and natural resources. All right. Thanks so much for watching. This is Radioactive Banana, signing out.